Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. And welcome back to the Friday Habit. Ben, How's going, Mark? how you doing, buddy? Man, it's going good. You know what's kind of funny is that whole time when you were rolling the intro music, I couldn't hear any of it. So I just see you bobbing your head in mm. silence and, yeah. and just kind of going like this. I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's rolling the intro music, but I can't hear it right I know, now. Sorry. So. I was enjoying the party all by myself <laughs> over on the side of, <laughs> of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Hey, we need to have some like nicknames on the show at some point. Do you? Did you ever have a nickname in school or anything like that? Mm. Mark the something Labriola. Well, okay, so Labs was a big uh, one. Okay, Labs. Yeah. yeah, I had a buddy who used to call me Uncle Heat. Okay, <laughs> Uncle Heat. <laughs> yeah, is there a story there? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just hot. What can I say? <laughs> did you do, did you throw exuding, like a fast pitch? I'm or exuding did you? A, a, a radiating heat off myself. Oh, <laughs> no, okay, I, I gotcha. was not a, a good pitcher. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Is it? Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so what about you? <laughs> Did you have any? I, in you know, so in my Boy Scout troop, I don't really know why, but there was there's so many like there was like a so many Joshua's, but then there was somebody named Jonathan. And for some reason they mixed my name with Jonathan. So I was known as Benathan when I was in Boy Scouts. <laughs> they just called me Benathan. Yeah. So nice. Well, Hey, why don't you introduce our guest to our audience today? And then we can yes. ask him if he had any awesome. Yeah, names. let's, let's do it. I'm excited. So young Sue left a successful career in cryptocurrency software engineering to found his first eight figure e-commerce business, urban EDC, which by the way, I looked at, you should definitely check it out. Urban EDC, really, really beautiful stuff there. And it, it's a venture with impressive social media following. He then went on to launch Growth Jet, a climate neutral certified third party logistics company. I, I think I said that right. And then uh, he's also passionate about sharing the lessons he's learned with other entrepreneurs so they too can start a company that's both profitable and sustainable. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being on. Thanks for having on, uh, having me on, Mark and Ben. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I can hear that. I can hear the <laughs> okay, cheering nice. now. It's coming through. Yeah. Nice. So, I- any nicknames? Any, any nicknames coming your way? For myself or for you guys? <laughs> well, look, we're already so close. Like, you've already made yeah. up some nicknames <laughs> for us. Like,. <laughs> No, yeah, we're just wondering if you had, yeah, if you had any nicknames growing up. You know, a lot of my friends called me either Young or Sue, because the two syllables, I guess, is just one syllable too many. So, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you guys are Ben <laughs> and Mark, right? So, yeah, yeah. that's true. But, yeah, but for some reason, my friends extended mine to three syllables. Ben that's true. I'm like, what's up with yeah, that? It's I got the Uncle say. Heat. That's you know, Uncle. Heat. That's true. That's three, three syllables. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Heat. I'm going to call you that for now. It's Ben and Uncle Heat. All right. Coming at you live. Benathan and Uncle Heat. Great. Yeah. So, Young Sue, I am curious about just a little bit of your journey of how you got started and, you know, where you cut your teeth and just how you developed your business and, and all that stuff. So, I'd love for you to start at the beginning of, you know, maybe where you, you came from as far as like, you know, did he, did he grow up in California and, and go to school there and, and start a business when you were young or, or what did, what did that look like? Yeah. So I'll begin with, I guess my high school. So I went to a private boarding school and it was in new England and it was a, you know, it was a pretty, it was not a very diverse school. And so growing up in that environment, I felt I don't know, some kind of, you know, I wanted to do something big and, you know, all my Mm. peers, their fathers were like CTOs at these big companies. I I didn't know at the time because I was just a high schooler, but Mm. all these kids had their parents and, you know, some of these um, houses that they lived in were just mansions, (laughs) right? Yeah. So I, you know, just coming out of that, I I felt this kind of inner drive for myself that I, I wanted to start a company one day and eventually kind of make, make it big. Right. So 
that's kind of, uh, I guess, my inner inner drive and motivation started in high school. And then right, right after high school, I went to college up in Maine. So I went to Bowdoin College, the liberal arts school, pretty small. And I was interested in finance. And so I studied econ- economics. And then I graduated in 2009, which obviously perfect time to graduate during the yeah. Great Re- Recession. <laughs> And so I went into, I actually walked on Wall Street uh, for about two years. And Mm. during my time there, you know, I was always dabbling in things. So I was never happy with just a corporate job. And so I started writing for a personal finance blog, making $25 per article, which, uh, Took me, you know, at least a couple hours it to takes write. You five hours to make. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like, so, I really made five dollars an hour. <laughs> I mean, that's like below minimum wage, right? So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wow. So I was doing that. You know, I just wanted to get get my feet wet and doing something that's outside of just a corporate paycheck, the, mm-hmm. the biweekly paycheck. So right. I, I started there and then I started dabbling in, um, this is 2009. So the iPhone app ecosystem was really blowing Mm. up Mm -hmm. and I wanted to just get some apps out there. And so I actually, um, I I worked with a development company in Ukraine to build Mm. an app that would silence your phone by geolocation. And so if you're entering like a church, for example, Mm. it would automatically silence your phone or a library. A lot of people need that. Yeah. So I, I thought you were going to say like angry birds, like, Oh, you might've heard of oh, yeah. my app. Angry birds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, that's where he got his money to start his <laughs> EDC venture. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the issue with that app though is it's a hardware thing. So you can't control, mm. you know how there's that little like tab on your phone where it silences yeah. it. So like yeah. we, could, we couldn't get around that. So I actually pivoted into making like a group chat. And and this is before Facebook groups, before Telegram, mm-hmm. before any of these these things. So mm-hmm. I did that for a little while, but then I actually got let go from my first company that I was with, and that was not related mm. to all the side hustle stuff that I was doing. It was the company was just not in a good shape, and so I was actually what happened was I was sending my resume to my sister for review, and they caught the compliance team caught that and flagged it and they brought oh. me in and I was like sweating bullets and uh oh, geez. it was a very awkward conversation but it it was, I'm it sure was you rough. learned a lot don't send those kind of emails exactly. on your company email address it's like Gmail. exactly so, so I was you know 23 <laughs> at the time so you know I learned my lesson they're also like spying on your email which is also a little weird. yeah right anyways, exactly yeah. I wouldn't that, I wouldn't very expect true. that but it, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I got laid off there and then I decided, hey, you know what? It's probably not a good idea for me to continue paying these developers for this side hustle thing. So I I, I mm-hmm. stopped that then. I found another job. This was at a, a trading firm in Midtown and I was there for a year and I was one of the traders there and each trader covers a holiday. And so I was actually the youngest trader on the on the desk. And so I always got last pick and that always meant, um, July 4th. So I always had to, oh, so yeah. it's a 24 hour trading desk. So you have to stay up for 24 hours for one day oh, a year. Geez. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. Cause I actually tried to get, get some sleep, brought an aero mattress there and just take 15 minute naps here and there. But it was just, it was not very, um, I didn't get much sleep. Conducive to health and mindset. <laughs> exactly. So after that, I, um, I want, I started getting into startups and just watching a lot of videos and and listening to a lot of podcasts on startups at that time. And I I really got into it and I realized that New York city didn't offer that same community and energy as a place like San Francisco. And so I, I really, you know, I wanted to immerse myself at the heart of Silicon Valley. And so I moved to the Bay Area in 2011, at the end of 2011. Mm. It's actually September 13th, 2011. I remember that because I actually, I was crashing with a friend up in Berkeley and I pulled up the email that he sent me about how to get to his location. And this is like a week ago that I pulled up this email and it was just like crazy to like revisit that moment for me. Yeah. 
So when you were working your job, were you then just like eating cup of noodle and sleeping on a couch and spending all your extra money on trying to develop an app? Like, is that, was that kind of like your plan? Like, all right, I'm going to try to make it big with an idea and jump into this app world. And were you kind of just spending your extra money to, to do that? Yeah. You know, I was, I was taking the extra funds from my salary, my paycheck, and I was funding it towards these projects that I had in mind. And I didn't know, you know, obviously I, I didn't know if any of them were, would ever take off, but it was just, you know, I'm just one of those people that I need to just have something going. Like I, I'm so like, I'm just like, I, I need to have some kind of project always going. And so it, it gave me something to do during the off, you know, off hours, like late into the night, I would be working on this and it just, yeah, I guess that's just kind of the person that I am. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really valuable lesson. And again, I always tell, especially young people, it's important to figure things out and fail a lot when you're young, because I feel like you have so much more runway ahead of you and the risks that you take when you're younger don't have much as much of an impact on your life as when you're older. Uh, a lot of times people do it reverse, right? It's like, oh, they, they don't take any risks. And then they realize when they're 40 or 50, like, oh man, I'm not doing what I want to do. And let me spend all my retirement to try to make something happen and, and live this life that I've dreamed about living. When really my story is, is that, you know, in my twenties, I went all in on myself as a musician and wanted to see if I could make it as a singer, you know, and, and I had some decent success and kind of got to live my dream for a living throughout my twenties. And then when that all fell apart and, and the band I was in broke up and, and we disbanded, I was only 28 years old and it allowed me to kind of start a new life and career, you know, as a creative and, you know, and then that served me to where I'm at now, you know, in my early forties. Yeah. You know, I, I love that mentality because number one thing that I, that I try to avoid is having regrets. And so, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you guys know the story of Jeff Bezos, but he used a framework called the regret minimization framework. And so he, when he had, when he was at a New York firm of, of in finance, making millions of dollars a year, he was financially set, but he heard about the internet and wanted to get involved. And then he did this exercise where, um, he looked at himself as an 80 year old and looked back and said, okay, you know, if mm -hmm. I don't make this leap, like, am I going to regret this de decision? And ultimately, obviously, he went on to go create one of the most valuable companies in the world. And so I always try to keep that in the back of my mind, like when I'm making a decision on a daily basis, like if I don't do this today, will I regret it in the future? That's a, a really powerful, I guess, perspective to filter out your decision making. So, yeah. Do you ever watch, um, did you ever see that movie Napoleon Dynamite? I did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uncle Rico, he's always like, I could have thrown a football over the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to be uncle Rico. Exactly. <laughs> I was like wondering where this is going in the, in the wise words of uncle Rico. Okay. Yeah. That's I, right. I, I gotcha. <laughs> so, okay. So then, so you said, all right, I got to be where the, the business is happening, where, where mm -hmm. the, the energy is with the stuff that I want to be into. And so you kind of packed everything up and headed out west. That's right. So I, I arrived in Berkeley with just one suitcase. And that was the only thing that I had from a possession standpoint. You know, it was really humbling because I was sleeping on an air mattress at my friend's place for three months. And I had, I had no job. Mm. You know, I had no apartment. And, you know, I was barely scraping by. And it was just really humbling and... Uh, you know, I, 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 sometimes I bring, bring myself back to that moment to, you know, get me pumped up. What did your family, like, did, did you have parents that, that was, th were back yep. East and yeah. And you told them I'm going to go do this. And were they like, what are you doing? <laughs> they, they really, they actually, yeah, they told me I was crazy. And you know, it, this is during the great recession and I had a finance right. job. And so they were like, you should just be thankful and just, you know, appreciate what you have versus like taking this huge risk. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, uh, it was a one-way ticket. So it's not like I had plans to go back to New York. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, in a way that I went counter to my parents' advice, but it was one of the best decisions that I've, I've made and it kind of changed the entire trajectory of my career. So. Hmm. 
So you're living on your friend's couch three months, no job, just scraping by. Yeah. What, what, what happened? What changed? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I finally joined a startup that it, it was in San Francisco and it was a great experience. I was there for two years and then the company, you know, it's all these Silicon Valley startups are funded by VC money. And so when that dried up, the team, you know, got consolidated and I was one of those. So I was actually let go again two years after I joined that position. So here I was again, you know, without a job. And so at that point, I can't I, get a break. <laughs> at that point, I decided to do this crazy like coding boot camp. It was 13 weeks. And it's from 8 a.m. till like 9 p.m. and Monday through Saturday, right? And so I had no life for three months. But by the end of it, I was like so like, you know, I was like sleeping in JavaScript. Like it was just like I, I could just like code in my sleep, right? And so I interviewed at a company for an engineering position and they were so like they were they literally just cut me off from the interview because they were like, all right this guy is not a good fit. Like just like escort him out the building because like we're not interested. So basically I, I didn't even make it through the entire interview. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's rough, right? Wow. Um, <laughs> oh, no. So af after that, I, I, you know, I went back to that, Man. the coding bootcamp. They have like this, like, um, you know, like career person um, that helps you get, get jobs after the program. And, and I told him, he's like, Hey, don't worry. It's just one interview. Just prepare for the next one. Uh, and that was in two days. And so I, I, I calm, calmed myself down and I had the interview and that was with a cryptocurrency company called Ripple. And I was really fortunate that they really liked my finance background because they were trying to build a trading platform themselves. And so it was perfect mm -hmm. because I had the experience of all of these trading platforms. And then I had just done the, this crazy bootcamp for engineering. So it was like a mat match made in heaven. So they took me in. I was there for about a year and a half. Really, really great experience. Some of the smartest people that I that I know. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of like where I was for, for a year and a half. And then all the regulation stuff happen, started happening with cryptocurrencies around 2015, at the end of 2015. And at that point, like our team was just humming along and we were finally making progress. We were moving we're working with a remittance company in Mexico to move funds around on the blockchain. And this is like the first time in the history of this company that we were doing that. And then they told us, Hey, hold, hold up. You know, we need to make sure our compliance is, is good. Like just like stop what you're doing. And then at that point, you know, I, I, I always like to keep moving and I, I don't know if you see a pattern, but I, I need to see progress. Right. And so I just couldn't stand just not doing anything. And so I decided at that point to leave and start my own company. And this is at the end of 2015. That's awesome. So that it just seems like not staying still and, you know, making decisions quickly to move forward, you know, served you well. So, so tell us about that first company that you started and, you know, how, how did you get it off the ground and what was it exactly? And just that kind of journey. Absolutely. So after, you know, being a blockchain engineer at, you know, one of the hottest Silicon Valley com companies, I, I went from that to selling knives online. So a lot of my friends, engineering friends, they were thought I was crazy because I mean, I could literally, it was like, you know, during this time it was just starting to boom and I could find a job, you know, making pretty good money. Right. Any Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. In fact, I was getting emails left and right saying, Hey, you know, we have an offer for you. Like they didn't even care what I did. Like it was just crazy, but I was, I just stayed the course and launched this shop called urban EDC. So EDC stands for everyday carry. And so this is stuff that you carry on a daily basis. So like your wallet, maybe a watch, a pen, flashlight, pocket knife, this sort of stuff. All right. What's your, what's your EDC? What do you, what do you got? I got a little knife that I'm carrying with me right now. Yeah, I got and I got my my bench here. made here. Oh, nice! So I you got know. this night, this yeah. guy here. Nice, um, Ben. Where are you at? <laughs> there you go. Oh, nice. Oh, CRKT. Got my CRKT. So that that uh, yeah. designer, Jesper, yeah, yeah. he he's actually he actually works with us. Like we have a couple of designs. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a good nice. guy. No way. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Very cool. So yeah. So okay. So I, I have a question. Was EDC something that you were kind of into? You know, because Ben and I, you know, we we love the different little trinkets and things that help you do something productively or quickly, or you know, having something on you. I've got you know in my wallet here. I've got a pen that goes right in there that I can pull out and mm-hmm. write with at any moment. You know, I, I carry a keychain that has like some screwdriver, you know, on it. Like there's just, mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm always into the newest little kind of trinket and whatnot that I can kind of carry on me. So was that something that you were kind of into at the same time that you're doing all this other stuff? Or did you do like market research to be like, Oh, the most research thing or search thing on Google is knives and so you started a knife company or what, what did that look like? <laughs> yeah. So this is a really good question. So the reason why the jump seems so random from blockchain engineer to selling knives online is because I did a lot of self-reflection and did an exercise that I encourage a lot of, you know, a lot of people to do, which is if you go look at your credit card statements and see where you're spending your money. And so I realized that I was, you know, buying a lot of these little gadgets and and like titanium pens and little tabletop spin, um, spinners or whatever, right? And I realized, hey, like this is something that I'm I'm interested in. That so that was a, a, a good signal. And then I also, you know, another another thing that I do is um, look at the time that you're spending. So if you're spending time looking at, I don't know, like watching reviews on YouTube or you know, like reading about all like knives, for example, then that's another signal. So time and money are really the two components that I was looking at for myself. And I realized mm-hmm. that this is like an area that I, I enjoy, that I, I could see myself getting into. Those two things, time and money, um, that those exercises really helped me hone in on kind of like what area I wanted to get into. Although it seems kind of random, but that's why it, it, it seems random because I did, did those exercises. Yeah, that's really good. So it's kind of like what it's a revealing way to find out what are you personally interested and passionate about. And then you're like, hey, I'm personally interested and passionate about this. So it will make it more likely for me to be successful because I'll be interested in it. Is that kind of the next leap is like, hey, not only is this something I enjoy, but if I enjoy it, it'll help me actually make more money based on that. Yeah. So after you find out what your interests are, then you have to find the skill set that will generate money or, you know, some kind of skill set that offers value to the, to the market, right? So for me, my skill set was just generally operations. Like I knew that I could operate in terms of um, just execution. And so I didn't necessarily want to get into e-commerce, but e-commerce was just starting to boom and it, it just felt like the right thing to do. You know, I, I wanted to double down on my strengths. And so I used, you know, Shopify was just starting to emerge at that time. So knowing that I, I used Shopify, launched it. And you know, what's funny is I actually, the first time I launched the shop, I validated the, the store concept, concept by buying things off of Amazon and reselling it with no profit. And, oh, and this is... That's, that's a smart idea. So this was interesting because hmm. I didn't want to spend a ton of money on buying inventory right off the bat. So... Right. You know, I wasn't making anything. Obviously, I was just reselling them at that same price. But it just gave me a little bit of validation that, hey, there's something here I could build from this rather than just, you know, buying something like tens of thousands of dollars worth of inventory that nobody might want. And that allowed me to, you know, at least work from there instead of from just investing a ton in the beginning and then having a surprise like, hey, no one wants it type of outcome. So, yeah. Now I got a box of a thousand knives in my garage yeah. that I can't sell. Exactly. <laughs> no, that that's really, I mean, that's a really good idea. So how did you find some of your first customers? You know, did you do, run ads? Did you do SEO? Did you put it on Amazon Marketplace? Like what were some of the ways you found some of those first customers? Yeah. So before I launched the shop, I actually um, got a bunch of people to, uh, it was on Instagram. So I, I was able to get a fair amount of followers. And I did that through something very simple, which is like a lot of people were posting their pocket thumb photos. So people will just like take out everything from the pockets and kind of show off what they have. A lot of this stuff is like pretty expensive. And so, I don't know, it's like a weird thing, but it's like a social signaling or whatever, but you know, they, they want to feel cool. So they're like, oh, I have this knife that, you know, you can't really buy anywhere. 
So what I did was I reposted these guys' photos and these are people from the community, right? So um, when I repost them, they, they see it and then, you know, they, I, I give them credit, of course, and they are very thankful for the reshare and then they, they might follow or, you know, just, just, we just start interacting with these accounts, right? And possible customers. And so I was able to build up this account up to 10,000 followers. And from then I, you know, I, I had a little, um, landing page for e collecting emails. And so I would collect emails that way too. But yeah, it was just, I think it's really starting with the audience first and seeing mm -hmm. what they like and trying to build a little bit of audience before you launch is, is really important, mm -hmm. um, especially for, for feedback. Like, you know, you never know what they like until you actually go out there and, and do it. So that's kind of how I started building my audience first. But I mean, things have changed so much since then. And so mm -hmm. I'm almost sure. willing to bet that, you know, those first few people, you know, they're not going to be the same customers that we have now. Right. Right. But I think it's a very valid point because I think what happens a lot of times is people have a good idea or what they think is a good idea. And they're really excited and they're like, oh man, this is going to be huge. People are going to love this, you know? And it's like, well, are you actually asking the marketplace if that's something that they want or like, you know, or you think into a, a particular space like, oh, I bet every chef would really want this type of spatula or knife or something like that. And, and you get excited about this whole, but you never went out and actually asked chefs if they would really want it or not. It's just in your own mind and what you think would be beneficial or good for that community may actually be different than what's beneficial and, and useful for that community. So I think it's important that you kind of validate some of your ideas you know, through testing some of the markets in a, in a very simple way. And I think that takes a lot of patience, right? Because we want feedback and we want growth fast and now and quick, but a lot of times you have to put in this work in order to get those good results down the road later on. Yeah, that totally. I think it's a balancing act of like, you know, you have your, your ego. And so you're really proud of like, this, this idea is going to work or, you know, like this thing that I made, I know it's going to do well and you're so proud of it. But then when you go out there in the marketplace and no one wants it, then that's like reality. You're like, Oh, like crap. Like, you know, I'm so right. proud of what I built, but no one wants it. So what do I do now? Right. So I think it's like a, there's like a gut intuition portion of it where, yeah, you should be proud of what you have and what you built, but then you got to be realistic with the marketplace. And if they don't, want it, then there is no business. Somebody has to buy your stuff, right? So it's a little bit of like a humbling and kind of letting your ego aside, let the market, market speak for itself. Yeah. And I, I really like that you also kind of built relationships by going out there and, you know, adding value to other people by resharing what they were doing. I mean, added value to you too, but you were showing interest in them first rather than just being like, direct message, like, Hey, uh, check out my new website. I'm selling knives. And they're like, okay, sure. Like you kind of soft, like, Hey, build a little relationship with them. Eventually, you know, they'll probably be interested in you too, as you keep re resharing their stuff. So I, I just feel like that's a really classy way to do it. That is also, it's, it's just a good way to build a network. Yeah. I think you got to give value first, especially when you don't have a reputation, they got to trust you. Right. I mean, honestly, business mm -hmm. is all about trust. And if you can't build trust with it, with your customers, then you have, you have no business. So trust is everything. All right. We're going to pause this conversation here. Uh, go to the Friday habit.com there. You can find show notes for this episode. Uh, there you can also find links to our websites and ways to get in touch at the bottom of the page. You can download our guide to the Friday habit system that will show you how to set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of in your business. If you're not already, make sure you subscribe. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear next week's episode, subscribe so you get notified. Uh, also, leave us a review in Apple Podcast app uh, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to potentially be on one of our episodes uh, with a question you ask us, go ahead and record a quick message in your phone, voice memo, and email it to hello at the Friday Habit .com. Until next time, live every day like it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs>